Hello and welcome to our RKL webinar series, Coronavirus and its Impact on People, Process, and Profits. Before we start today's call, we would like to share a couple of housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded. We will provide you a link to the recording when it is available via email. All materials were emailed to all registrants around 10.15 a.m. this morning. You can also find the materials on our Coronavirus Resource Center at rklcpa.com. All lines are muted and will remain muted during the webinar. Questions can be submitted using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. However, due to the size of the group today with more than 700 registrants, we will only have time to address a few questions throughout the webinar. RKL clients who have questions specific to their organizations should reach out directly to your RKL advisor. One hour of CPE in the field of business law will be issued to participants on this call. To receive your CPE, participants must be connected to the session, both audio and presentation for its entirety. Additionally, participants must answer three questions and elements of engagement. Elements of engagement will be through the polling feature. If you're viewing through a web browser, ensure that you have pop-ups enabled. Additionally, if you're using multiple monitors, the poll may appear on your second screen. At this time, I would like to turn the presentation over <clears throat> to Eric Wanger, who will introduce our team for today's webinar. Eric, the floor is yours. All right, well, thank you, Jen, and welcome to everybody here on this Easter weekend. So glad that you're able to join us in our fourth in the series of webinars that we've been providing on the coronavirus and how you as business owners and leaders can be responding to this. This morning, our panel includes two familiar faces and one new name. Nick Boyer will be joining us. Um, Nick is with our RKL Wealth Management, where he is the chief investment officer and a fellow partner in the firm. And Nick's going to be providing some excellent overview today on the economics, what's going on in our world, how does that impact the markets, and how do we individually and as businesses respond to that. Let me go here to our outline for today. Steph is going to be talking with us today about unemployment compensation. So this is a topic that just a month ago, I would say hardly any companies asked us questions. And quite honestly, many of us rarely spent much time digging into exactly how does unemployment work. And of course, that's changed in a matter of weeks. And now that's an extremely popular topic of questions. And so we're going to spend some time understanding those nuances, both so that we understand how it would impact employees and we also understand how it impacts employers and the decision making that they might make. Also, talking about recalling employees, if we have companies that are applying for PPP money, um, they may need to increase their headcount. They may be looking to bring back employees as the governor allows businesses to reopen. What's that process for bringing employees back to work that had been on furlough? Nick will provide the economic update, as, as mentioned, and then Robin will finish us here with the tax credit update on some of the um, specific examples there. Before we dive right into it, there were just a couple of miscellaneous updates that I wanted to share. First of all, yesterday, the IRS came out with yet another notice that has changed deadline dates. And this deadline, you may recall last week, we shared a chart that showed something a little bit strange. And that was that first quarter estimates for taxpayers were due July 15th and second quarter was due one month prior on June 15th. Well, the IRS has now said that doesn't really make sense. So now basically what they're saying is any quarterly estimated tax payment is deferred until July 15th. So there's no need to make any cash payments at June 15th. Second point here, I just wanted to mention this. This is something that we stumbled upon here just recently, and it's a website called pppstats.info. If you go there and check that out, this is, this is reporting that gives folks an idea of how's the SBA doing in allocating funds. You'll recall it was $349 billion. Um, based on the reporting last night, and you can see the sources that they're using for this, approximately 40% of that money has been allocated. 
but zero dollars of it have been dispersed. And that's where many of our clients are saying, hey, I put in an application. They may or may not have yet received an SBA loan number, which is one of those steps in the process. But at this point, nobody has yet received cash. Another question that comes up quite a bit, people are saying, well, can I defer taking the money? Like after I am approved, can I, can I you know, try to game the system a bit in when I accept those funds? The rules say the bank has 10 days to fund that loan after it gets approved. So the, the shorter an answer is no, there's not a lot of room to maneuver in that. Um, the money will come and your eight week clock will start. Um, one other point on this, I did want to mention there's been some discussion in Congress in the last couple of days about an extra $250, sorry, $250 billion in what is being called the PPP refill. Um, that's been proposed by Senate Republicans. It did not get much support from Democrats. So at this point, there is no refill in place. Um, so stay tuned on that one. One other point, and I'm not going to go through this slide in detail, other than to say, there's some guidance that came out from the SBA that was updated on April 8th that said, if you have more than 500 employees, you still might be eligible for PPP. And there's some specifics here that you need to read in this slide to go look at your net income levels, your equity levels to see if you may be able to qualify. But the punchline here is there are more companies that may be eligible than what we previously thought based on the prior guidance. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Steph and she's gonna talk about our unemployment compensation topic. Thank you, Eric. Good morning. Um, employers have suddenly found themselves in a unique situation of answering questions from their employees regarding unemployment compensation, as Eric has mentioned. And so because of that, uh, we've been receiving a lot of questions from our clients seeking a better understanding of the process in order to help guide their employees. I'm going to provide a crash course for you here today. Um, I'd like to preface this by stating that each state has their own un unemployment site, um, and our webinar today is going to focus solely on the state of Pennsylvania. So there's a credible amount of information on, on the Pennsylvania's unemployment website, but for the purposes of unemployment related to coronavirus, I recommend that you start by um, clicking on the Learn More under Information for Workers Impacted section on their homepage. The COVID-19 um, resource and guidance page provides many links to additional areas that a claimant and an employer will find beneficial. You'll see that on to the right side, there is an FAQ document, as well as one for the employer. So claimants can uh, easily file a claim by clicking on file initial claim icon. This page will take them right through some quick quick tips for filing, and at the bottom of that page, they will find the file the initial claim button at the bottom. The PA Department of Labor and Industry provides a compensation filings material checklist, uh, which outlines what is needed to file an initial claim. Utilizing this checklist will help expedite the online filing process. Additionally, the department provides short one to three minute video clips that explain the process as well. So how is the weekly benefit determined? That is the question we frequently receive as well. The weekly benefit rate is calculated based on the gross wage paid by the base year, which is generally the first four of the last five completed calendar quarters prior to the application for benefit date. The amount of the money that is paid by all employers covered by the unemployment compensation law during the base year determines whether the claimant qualifies for benefits and for what amount. So the claimant must also have sufficient qualifying wages or total wages in the base year. In other words, all the wages cannot have been earned in just one quarter. There's additional funds available. Um, if you're eligible for benefits, the claimant may receive an additional $5 per week for a dependent spouse, plus $3 per week for one dependent child. If the claimant doesn't have a dependent spouse, the claimant can receive $5 weekly for one dependent child, plus $3 weekly for a second child. In either case, the allowance for dependents cannot exceed $8 per week. 
On this site, uh, you can find the weekly benefit rate FAQs. And within this page, the claimant can click on the link to begin to estimate what their weekly benefit will be. So I'll take you through an example. So if we look at an individual making $48,000 a year, the first step is to determine the base year. So if the claimant is applying for benefits in April 2020, the base year is January 2019 through December 2019. Step two is determine the, higher, the high quarter. Determine the total gross wages received during the, each quarter in the base year. The quarter where the claimant was paid the most money is considered the high quarter. The high quarter determines the weekly benefit rate. So for our example here, $48,000 earned evenly equals a high quarter of $12,000. The weekly benefit rate generally should equal about one half of the full-time weekly wages as determined by the high quarter. The site provides a financial chart to help the claimant estimate their rate for, of compensation. So for our example, our client will receive a weekly benefit of $472. With the additional funds provided by the CARES Act, our claimant will earn a total of $1,072 per week, which if you annualize that would equate to $55,744. Note that the maximum benefit amount in the state of Pennsylvania is $573 per week, and that is not including the additional $600 per week. And benefits can be earned for up to 26 weeks. So with the additional of $600, an individual making approximately $60,000 or less annually will actually make more money on unemployment. So for an hourly worker, their earnings varied, where their earnings varied, the higher quarter here is $5,300. So the weekly benefit rate for this individual would be $209 plus the $600 would provide the claimant with $809 per week. We continue to field a lot of questions around the additional $600 weekly benefit provided by the federal government. This benefit is provided to claimants receiving benefits beginning March 29th through July 31st. The Department of Labor and Industry will begin issuing the additional $600 per week once they receive guidance from the United States Department of Labor and once they've modified their system in order to implement the guidance. Once implemented, the payments will be retroactive ending to the week ending April 4, 2020. It's anticipated that this benefit will be paid on a biweekly basis the week after the claimant files for and receives the regular unemployment compensation payment. This benefit is taxable and therefore will be subject to 10% federal tax withholding if the claimant elected to have taxes withheld from their regular unemployment benefits. Labor and industry will decide eligibility for the additional $600 based on elig eligibility for the underlying program. So individuals do not have to separately apply for the benefit. In addition to regular unemployment compensation, if the claimant is or becomes eligible for one of the following, the additional $600 will be paid. So shared work or short, short, term, short time compensation, trade adjustment allowances, pandemic emergency unemployment compensation, and pandemic unemployment assistance. This chart provided by the labor and industry illustrates when a claimant will typically receive funds as they file their biweekly claim. So typically funds are available two days after the claimant files their biweekly claim with the exception of Friday and Sunday. Another popular question is, when will unemployment be available for self-employed independent contractors and gig workers? As of this morning, um, they are still encouraged by the department to continue to check their page for filing instructions. At this time, those eligible should not file a claim through the existing online system or phone number. The same goes for those who are receiving unemployment benefits prior to the pandemic and who may be exhausting those benefits. The department will update their website with instructions on accessing those benefits once guidance from the federal government is received. And those who fall into this category are encouraged to visit the site regularly as well for updated instructions and to find FAQs about unemployment compensation. 
The circumstances that we are in today have put some people and families in positions they have never experienced before, and they may find themselves struggling to make ends meet while they're waiting for unemployment benefits to be approved. Also under the COVID-19 section of the website, you can find a link for additional resources. On this page, you will find details regarding many benefits that may be available during this challenging and unprecedented time. There's information for resources that may assist claimants and their families, such as information for those permanently separated from their employer to aid in their search for employment, healthcare resources, social services, food assistance, utilities, assistance, childcare and housing resources, assistance paying debt, along with mental health and substance abuse services. Before I continue to the employer information, we're gonna take a moment for a polling question. To be eligible for CPE, each polling question must be answered. Question. Did your organization apply for the PPP or other emergency loan programs? Yes, no, or I don't know. Now I'm going to take a moment to talk about unemployment compensation from the employer's perspective. Another common question that we are getting is, what if I recall my employees and they don't want to return to work because they make more money on unemployment? First, as a courtesy to the employee, notify them that they are being recalled or offered a job and that you are taking appropriate safety precautions by following the recommendations issued by the CDC to provide a clean work environment, and their refusal to return to work may impact their eligibility to continue to receive unemployment compensation. The intent of the benefit under the CARES Act is to provide temporary assistance during this tough economic time, not to further damage businesses by enticing employees to remain on unemployment. Section 402A, Section 402A of PA's Unemployment Compensation Law provides in part that an employee shall be ineligible for compensation for any week in which their employment is due to failure without good cause to accept suitable work, provided that the employer who offers the work notifies the department and provides documentation of the refusal within seven days of when the offer is made. The department provides this online form UC 1921 for employers to complete and send electronically to notify the department of a claimant's refusal of suitable work. Employers are all too accustomed to the challenges associated with responding to the paper-based unemployment compensation information request. So the state information data exchange system also refers to as SIDES and SIDES e-response are designed to make it more efficient and easier for employers and third-party administrators to respond to unemployment compensation information requests free of charge by providing a secure, electronic, and nationally standardized format to respond. With the influx of unemployment applications, employers are starting to, or in the very near future, may be inundated with paper-based unemployment compensation information requests. So if you're not already signed up with the sides, you may want to consider enrolling, especially if you aren't at your place of employment and receiving mail on a daily basis. In order to gain access to the web-based system that will allow you to receive and respond to Pennsylvania's request for separation information, which is equivalent to the yellow form UC45 form, electronically, rather than by mail, um, you need to fill out their application. And this can be done um, on their website. This form is located on their website. And then once it's completed, you will email it directly to their site. The site provides an easy to use employer guide that will walk you through how to use the system. 
um, step by step. It's really easy, simple to, to follow. And I'm just going to take a moment just to highlight just a couple of slides that are in there to give you a sense of what the system looks like. So this first one is just a snapshot of the, the e-response homepage. And then this section will illustrate where you will go to respond to a UC claim. Once you've been enrolled into the program, you'll be issued a PIN number. You'll use your PIN number as well as utilize your UC account number to gain access to the site, which is illustrated here on the PA Unemployment Compensation Contributions Rate Notice. Once logged in as the employer, you can access and respond to each of the claims that are available to you. Lastly, before you close out of the system, uh, you'll want to make sure that you provide or print your confirmation statement. You want to print it or save it someplace um, so you can have it to refer to in the future should you need it. So before I wrap up, I'd like to touch on preparing to bring your employees back once you receive benefits such as the PPP program or other quarantine, if the quarantine is lifted. There's a few things to consider as you develop your recall plan. So do you already have a written layoff or furlough recall plan? If so, you'll need to follow your own policy. Next, think about the representations made to employees who were furloughed or laid off. Did you give any indication, either orally or in writing of any form, about, the, about what the company would do about their job should economic circumstances change? Did management representatives make any promises of reemployment or unintentional preferential treatment? If so, the company needs to consider whether its representations to departing employees created rights where none otherwise existed. Avoid discrimination claims. Determine how you will avoid accusations when rehiring your workforce. And consider how you'll ha handle employee benefits if they need to be reinstated. Similar to planning for a furlough, layoff, or a reduction in force, you'll want to develop a plan for recalling your workforce. Conduct an evaluation of your business and determine how many positions you'll bring back at a time. What criteria will you bring, use to bring back your workforce? Consider seniority, job function, things along those lines. Do you have critical positions or employees with key skills that need to return first? Evaluate if you need to adjust roles and responsibilities if you're unable to bring your entire workforce back. Some employees may need to perform additional duty. How will you notify your employees of the recall? So if, an employee, if you notify by phone, you'll wanna consider a secondary option as a form of documentation, such as email or sending a registered letter with a delivery notice. As noted previously with um, filling out the form for the department, you would need to supply some additional documentation of someone's ref refusal to work, uh, and that can be used for that purpose. Also consider how many days the employee will have to respond to the recall notice before extreme measures such as termination or loss of unemployment benefits occur. Inform your employees of any new protocol upon return so they can plan accordingly and know what to expect. I want to note that the tips explained here today are commonly used by HR experts, but it's always important to make sure that your policy works for your business. No two companies are exactly the same, so make sure that you're doing what your employees would expect you to do. Also, make sure you're, you always consult with your legal counsel before, during, and after reduction events, even the ones that are temporary, to ensure that you're complying with all local, state, and federal laws. We're going to take a moment here and touch on the navigating the emotions of returning employees. So when it comes to time to bring them back from furlough or a layoff, there is likely going to be a sense of relief for both the employee and leadership, eager to be productive and find financial relief. However, those aren't the only emotions that are going to be felt by your employees. There will be a period of adjustment for everybody. You will notice some trepidation, some excitement, even anxiety, and perhaps some anger. So employees returning to work may exhibit one or more of the following job-related behaviors. 
exhilaration, enthusiasm, high motivation, desire to please or impress, fear or anxiety, lack of confidence, withdrawal or isolation, problems with memory or focus, increased sensitivity to constructive performance feedback, difficulty getting along with others, sarcasm, cynicism, or anger, performance problems related to erosion of skill, distraction, or fatigue. So taking all of this into consideration and providing resources to your employees upon return, such as through your employee assistance program or simply talking openly with your workforce, um, about understanding the various emotions that they may feel as they transition back to work and offering an open door policy to anybody who is struggling and they need to talk um, are just some good business practices to consider. So before I turn it over to Nick, uh, we'll take a moment for another polling question. Again, to be eligible for CPE, each polling question must be answered. So has your organization laid off or furloughed employees or have plans to do so in the future? Yes, no, or not yet. Thank you, Stephanie. Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for joining us today. So here's a quick agenda of what I'm planning to cover. I'm gonna walk through some updates on COVID-19, briefly cover the US economy, the impact on small business, what all this stimulus looks like, and then I'm gonna wrap with our key takeaways. It's uh, quite a bit to cover, so I'm going to try to move pretty quickly, but if you have any questions on any of this, please feel free to reach out and follow up afterward, as we're happy to go into more detail. So obviously this isn't a very pleasant topic to talk about, but here's an update on the COVID-19 figures so we can put them into some kind of perspective. The numbers you see in the shaded columns in the middle are updated as of this morning. The global figures are on the left and the US figures are on the right. We're now over 1.6 million confirmed cases globally and approaching 500,000 confirmed cases in the US. Deaths, of course, are now approaching 100,000 globally, and we're now over 16,000 deaths in the United States. In the table here, you can see these figures in relation to other outbreaks. It's worth noting that while COVID-19 obviously spread far more rapidly than SARS in 2012 on the left, or MERS in 2000, uh, I'm sorry, in 2002, or MERS in 2012, it also appears to be significantly less fatal. On the other side of the table, the H1N1 swine flu in 2009 and the regular seasonal flu as estimated by the CDC this year infected far more people, but they each also had a significantly lower fatality rate based on the numbers we, we have today. Of course, it's worth noting that it's possible that our data on the number of COVID-19 cases is still low because of limited testing. Although I'd note that if the case numbers go up dramatically, that also likely means that the fatality rate is much lower. But in any case, those are the numbers. So this slide comes from a press briefing by the President's Coronavirus Task Force and was presented by Dr. Deborah Burks. The key here all along has been to try to flatten the curve, and I'm sure you've heard that term used. Ultimately, this slide shows that we appear to have flattened the curve significantly. The dark blue curve that looks like a mountain represents the initial estimates of the death toll if the virus were to have spread without intervention or mitigation. The much smaller, flatter curve in light blue below shows what the task force is now forecasting after significant measures have been taken. And of course, that includes extensive stay at home orders across the United States, social distancing and restrictions on international travel. You can see this range here shows a total death number of up to 100,000 to 240,000 at the high end of the range. So where do those numbers come from? The data that Dr. Burks and the president are currently looking at come from a model by the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, or IHME. 
Importantly, what you can see here is the IHME model is projecting that we reach the peak of daily new deaths in two days on April 12th. So the red line there shows the actual figures. The red dotted line shows the forecast. All the pink area on either side of that line represents the range of outcomes in best and worst case scenarios. So I just add here that this model has been tracking the real data fairly closely and appears to be reasonably accurate. At the end of the day, this would ultimately be very good news because it would appear that we are approaching the deceleration phase of this pandemic in the United States. Similarly, when you look at this next chart, which is from the same model, it shows the cumulative total deaths from COVID-19 projected through August 4th. That current projection is just over 60,000 total deaths over that time frame. Again, the orange line is actual numbers. The dotted line here is what the model is projecting. And the light orange area is the range of outcomes and best or worst case scenarios. So again, we've been watching this data very closely for several days. Uh, we'd note that it's been tracking the actual results fairly closely. Closely, The good news here is, is that they've had to revise down the projections for deaths given the actual information that they've received in just the last few days. Obviously, all of those deaths are a tragic loss. But this helps put some of this into perspective. So what does it all mean for the economy? Switching gears to the U.S. economy, in order to understand the economic impact of COVID-19, it's important to recognize that what drives the U.S. economy is, of course, the U.S. consumer. The colored bar chart on the right side of this slide shows the components of gross domestic product, or GDP, and you can see there in the red circle that almost 70% of U.S. GDP comes from consumption. So the most important measure of health of the U.S. consumers, since they are the driver of the U.S. economy, is the U.S. employment picture. The slide here shows how the U.S. consumer and the economy were on very healthy footing heading into the pandemic. The gray line shows unemployment, and the blue line shows wage growth. Unemployment, as you look to the right, uh, lower right-hand corner of the chart, and you look to see where the red arrow is pointing, unemployment was at a 50-year low, and real wages were growing at a very healthy clip of 3.3% and significantly outpacing inflation. So ultimately, the hope here is that the strength in the employment picture heading into this pandemic should, in theory, help to provide some cushion in getting through this event. That said, the data looks ugly and it will continue to get uglier over the next few weeks. This chart here shows U.S. payroll employment going back 15 years all the way up through March. Again, you can see that up until this event, the trend was very strong and healthy. Of course, yesterday, I'm sure you will have seen in the news that we got another 6.6 .6 million initial unemployment claims, which brings the three-week total for jobless claims to roughly 16.5 million. So based on those actual numbers, what you're seeing in this chart is an estimated decline in U.S. payrolls of about 20 million coming in April. The next slide here shows the impact of that kind of reduction in payroll employment and what that would do to the unemployment rate. As you can see at the upper right-hand corner of the chart, that approximates a roughly 17% unemployment rate. That's something the likes of which we haven't experienced since the Great Depression. Obviously, those are pretty sobering numbers. That said, the overall impact on the economy still depends entirely upon how quickly we can reopen businesses and get people back to work. One of the keys in all this, of course, will be small businesses. Historically, small businesses tend to lead the U.S. economy out of recessions. This chart here breaks down U.S. private employment into two groups. The line in green shows businesses over 500 employees, and the red dotted line shows businesses under 500 employees, or what the SBA defines as a small business. So what's important to note here is that companies under 500 employees now make up nearly half of all private sector employment in America. So taking a closer look at the impact on small business, they have obviously been hit hard. This chart here is interesting from a company called Homebase, which is a scheduling tool used by small businesses to manage their employees, including timesheets, schedules, payrolls, et cetera. 
The company has now provided this data, uh, this daily data on recent schedules of small businesses and their hourly employees, and they've made it public. You can see here that the hours worked by hourly employees have fallen off sharply since mid-March. Obviously, and very simply, businesses that are shut down can't give employees hours, and employees that can't work can't earn income. So this chart breaks it out by sector. And while you can see that hourly workers in every sector have been hit pretty hard, this shows there is significant variance by industry. Specifically, the beauty and personal care industry, which is shown at the bottom in red, have slowed down the most. While home and repair, which is the, in the turquoise color at the top, has fared a little bit better than others. You can also see professional services in green, retail in dark blue, food and drink in gray, and leisure and entertainment in purple. Obviously, the goal here is to get those numbers uh, moving in the right direction in terms of an upward trajectory and moving back towards positive when we reopen the economy. So all of those charts speak to the employment and wage data continuing to get worse in April. Of course, the stimulus bill provided a great deal of capital to small businesses, among other areas of the economy. But as Eric mentioned at the outset, um, nobody's received any capital yet, and it won't be clear for another few weeks as to how well it is or isn't working. One of the things we'll be watching is this Small Business Optimism Index uh, published by the NFIB. This is historically a very good proxy for small business economic activity. The chart goes back to 1975. So again, in, in the top right-hand corner of the chart, you can see the index was quite strong heading into the pandemic, and it even surprisingly held up pretty well early. That said, the purple arrow points to where we are today at 96.4. So it's definitely come down sharply, and in all likelihood, it'll probably come down even further. Of course, the key here and what we'll be watching uh, is to see if it drops near or below the red line, which represents the lows on the index for the past recessions and crises, including, you can see down at the bottom there, the 2008 financial crisis. So we've broken below the long-term average, uh, but we're still a long way away from uh, some of the worst crises in history. Importantly, one of the reasons we don't think that it will is, is because, as we've been saying, this is not a financial crisis. Credit has continued to flow into the economy, and right now we are very encouraged by charts like this, which show bank loans. This chart shows CNI loans across the United States. As you can see here, these, sky, these loans have skyrocketed, and banks have already begun increasing lending by over $220 billion since February. Now remember, the latest data here doesn't yet include the PPP program that has begun to ramp up or any of the other programs that the Treasury and the Fed have announced. So speaking of those programs, that brings us to the Exchange Stabilization Fund, or the ESF. Here's what the ESF looks like. This is obviously a fairly complicated diagram, but I'll try to walk you through the basics fairly quickly. You all know by now the Treasury and the Fed announced a number of programs to provide liquidity and support to the U.S. economy. The ESF is the key government vehicle that will allow that to happen. The way it works here is the Treasury will use the ESF as represented in the, in the blue at the top left-hand corner of the slide to provide equity investments into a number of special purpose vehicles, or SPVs, which are the green ovals that you see in the middle. The Federal Reserve, which is the large orange box on the, on the bottom left-hand corner, is lending money into the SPVs on top of the Treasury's equity. This debt from the Fed allows the SPVs to leverage the equity from the Treasury in order to increase the overall amount of funds that can be used to support the economy. And then what will happen is the funds in the SPVs will be used to purchase various assets and loans across the economy. And that's sort of what you're seeing on the right hand. The example in this particular diagram is where the Main Street Lending Facility at the green oval at the very bottom, through the green arrows that are attached to those, those orange triangles, will be providing capital to various banks. Again, the banks are represented by the orange triangles there. What they'll be doing is purchasing loans or tranches of loans to take them off bank balance sheets. 
So there are actually six SPVs that are being set up. Coming back to the green ovals in the middle, the lighter oval at the top is being set up to provide liquidity to municipalities. So that's your state and local governments. The second light green oval below that represents three facilities that are being set up to help basically to smooth the functioning of capital markets. You've got the, the PMCCF, which is the primary uh, market credit, corporate credit facility, the SMCCF, which is the secondary market credit, corporate credit facility, and then the TALF. The two dark green ovals at the bottom are a little bit more relevant for small and mid-sized businesses. Those include the PPP lending facility and the Main Street expanded lending facility, which I'll touch on just briefly. So in the essence of time, I won't go into in a whole lot of detail on any of these facilities. Importantly, our very own Ryan Hurst has posted extensive details on these programs, including a very nice piece this morning on the Main Street Lending Program. You can actually find more details on all that um, at the RKL Coronavirus Resource Center, which you can find at rklcpa.com. Ultimately, what both the PPP and the Main Street facilities will do once they're funded is that they will begin to purchase those assets directly from the banks. As you can see in terms of the PPP lending facility here, this will purchase loans on a non-recourse basis, meaning the facility will assume all the credit risk for PPP loans from the banks. It currently has the capacity of about $350 billion, but as Eric Winger had mentioned at the outset, there are talks in Congress about a refill. And that's been due to the high demand for these loans, uh, obviously because they are uh, forgivable under certain circumstances, although nothing yet has specifically been announced. The key here is that the Fed will be taking all the credit risk uh, from the PPP loans off the bank balance sheets. This takes us to the Main Street Expanded Loan Facility this is geared a little bit more toward providing loans toward uh, larger, somewhat larger, but more healthier businesses. They're obviously not as attractive to businesses uh, as the PPP loans because they are term facilities that are not to be forgiven. Uh, for these loans, the banks must retain 5% of the value of those loans on their balance sheet, as the Main Street facility will only purchase 95% of the value of the loan tranches. Again, without going into a whole lot of details, the key for this facility, as well as the PPP, is to help take assets off the bank balance sheets and either completely remove them uh, in the case of the PPP or in the case of the Main Street facility to reduce the bank's credit risk so that they have the capacity to continue to do business despite all the new loan volume that's been created. So again, the key here is to keep bank credit flowing by clearing up space on the balance sheets for banks. This is just that chart again. Ultimately, the key here is understanding why all this complexity, why the need for this vehicle. Under normal circumstances, those banks, the orange triangles, wouldn't be able to make as many loans as are currently being demanded due to volume, the underwriting process, and various capital requirements, among other things. Also, the special purpose vehicles, or the SPZ, SPVs, have been set up because the Fed is not actually set up to lend directly to small businesses. The Fed is actually required under its mandate to act only as a lender of last resort. So they generally cannot just take all these assets and, and loans and assume them onto their balance sheet, and they generally cannot just lend directly into small businesses. So that's the ESF. But at the end of the day, what does all this stimulus add up to? This is a really nice table here that shows global monetary and fiscal stimulus that has been added to the global economy since February. You can see the most recent amounts for the U.S. in the red box. Starting at the left, the Federal Reserve is providing $4.8 trillion, or roughly 22% of GDP. If you come over into the middle columns, the U.S. government is providing $2.71 trillion, or nearly 13% of GDP. And then, of course, the columns on the right, you can see all in total for the United States, it's $7.5 trillion of stimulus for a combined total of 35% of GDP. 
you come down the chart here, this looks other countries around the world. You can see globally the numbers are also very large. So you've got the Eurozone, Japan, the United Kingdom, China, and a, and a group of others uh, at the bottom. At the very bottom in total, you can see here that that amounts to $8.24 trillion in central bank liquidity. Coming over that $6.77 trillion in government stimulus for a, a global total of just over $15 trillion or what represents 17.3% of global GDP. So obviously this is all very important because while shutting down the economy has led to an historic collapse in employment and wages, it's important to remember that the size of this stimulus is also completely unprecedented and historic. These totals uh, represent significantly more than was provided during even the 2008 financial crisis. So I'm going to move through the rest of these slides pretty quickly, but these are the shapes of recoveries as represented by the great uh, financial crisis. You can see the top left is V-shaped, the top right is U-shaped, and the bottom is an L-shaped or more of a protracted recession. Ultimately, the question becomes, which one are we expecting? When we look at a uh, forecast like this one, um, we see that they're, they're calling for a 25% decrease in second quarter GDP. In the third quarter there, they're calling for a 2% decrease. So that will come back off of that 25% bottom pretty rapidly. And then returning to positive growth of 3% in the fourth quarter. That would be a little bit more like the U-shaped recovery. Other forecasters like Goldman Sachs here are showing uh, what looks a little bit more like a V-shaped recovery. You can see in the purple circle here that they're forecasting a 12% increase in third quarter GDP followed by a 10% increase in the, in the fourth quarter. Again, that's a little bit more like the V-shaped recovery. At the end of the day, it's anyone's guess what the outcome will be, but we know it'll largely be driven by how quickly we can get the economy back open. So ultimately, the reason we're optimistic here that this won't become an L-shaped recovery is because this still has not become a financial crisis. And based on all the stimulus we just talked about, we don't expect that it will. This chart here shows U.S. financial conditions since the, the beginning of the year. The lower that line is, the looser conditions are. The higher that number goes, the tighter financial conditions become, and the higher the cost of capital for businesses and households. You can see here that financial conditions were very loose at the start of the year over on the left, and then the pandemic hit, and in late February, financial conditions tightened rapidly with the index moving up over 3% in just a few weeks. Then following all the federal uh, government and Federal Reserve stimulus actions, financial conditions eased up again and came back down over 1% to where we are today at 100.36. So stimulus brought conditions back down and eased them significantly. This final chart here shows the same index going back 30 years to 1990. You can see it on the right-hand side, the purple arrow is where we are today at 100.36. The key here is the white line is the 30-year average. So we're just above the 30-year average, a little tighter than the 30-year average in terms of financial conditions. But the red line is the level where past financial crises have occurred. The sharpest of which, of course, was the 2008 financial crisis, which you can see in the middle. So ultimately, financial conditions have become a little tighter than average, but we're still a long way from this becoming financial crisis. So just to wrap our key takeaways, COVID-19 is tracking the IHME model now, projecting a peak in daily U.S. deaths on April 12th. We think the U.S. economy will bottom out in the second quarter. We see a U-shaped recovery with GDP returning to positive in the fourth quarter. We note that small business is key, and, and yet the recovery will be asymmetric by industry group. Uh, the fiscal and monetary stimulus, which is unprecedented, is important, uh, but obviously some programs will take a little bit longer to have effect than others. Ultimately, we believe financial conditions will remain supportive so we can avoid, avoid a more protracted recession. And that's what I've got for you today. So with that, thank you very much for your time. Before I pass this over to Robin, we've got another survey question for you. Are you making changes to your personal investment strategy amid changing market conditions? Yes, no, or not yet. Thanks, Nick. Uh, so I think in the essence of time, I'm going to move on to my section uh, while we leave the polling question up. So you'll have a little bit more time to answer, but I'm going to start um, 
into my presentation here. So um, earlier this week, I received a phone call from an RKL, RKL team member uh, with a question regarding payroll tax credits. And I started to answer the question and the person on the other end of the phone sounded confused. And it took me a minute, but we finally realized we were actually talking about two different payroll tax credits. So after all the legislation over the past couple of weeks, uh, there are now multiple options for employers to defer or eliminate certain payroll taxes, which is great since so many businesses are experience, experiencing cash flow shortages, but similar to how um, all these days are starting to blur together, I think so are all of these legislative acts. Uh, so I'm going to walk through each of the tax credits and the deferral programs side by side, and then also we're going to discuss how they interplay with each other because they do have impacts on one another. Okay, so hopefully you've answered the polling question and you can see this chart. Um, but on this slide, I've, I put together a chart that walks us through each one of these credits or deferrals or programs or opportunities that um, employers have to uh, maintain that cash flow and to defer or um, have a credit against their payroll taxes. Um, of course, the payroll protection loan program is, is different, but I want to bring it in here because it, it definitely um, factors into how each of these are utilized. Um, so we've heard a lot about the emergency paid sick and emergency paid family leave refundable tax credit. So then we also have the employee retention tax credit. So these are our two tax credits that are both offsetting the employer portion of Social Security. They act a little bit differently, and we're going to walk through some examples that hopefully help to illustrate this. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide um, talking about each of these columns, but I did want to mention those are the two credits. So when you hear someone say, oh, payroll tax credit, just realize that there is more than one. Um, and then there's the payroll tax deferral, which came from the CARES Act. Um, this is not a credit. It's just an opportunity to defer some of those payroll taxes. Uh, what you would do is you would defer the payments now, and then by the end of 2021, you would need to remit 50% uh, of those deferred payments, and then by the end of 2022, you would need to remit the remaining 50%. And that's any employer portion of Social Security um, from that March 27th deadline or date through um, the end of the year. And again, this is a deferral. It's not a credit. And then lastly, um, the, the payroll protection program, again, not a credit or a deferral, but I want to show you um, through some examples in my slides how this really does interplay uh, with some of these credits and deferrals. And again, I just want to take a minute to reiterate what Eric said earlier. I know many people have seen the less than 500 employees and thought, okay, I, I'm not eligible, and, and that may not be the case anymore, and to, you really need to take a deeper dive into um, some of those tests that, that the SBA has put out, and also realizing that those tests are under the SBA rules, and not to confuse them with the aggregation rules um, that you see in the first credit under FSLA and FMLA. They are different. Okay, so our first example here, um, we're going to walk through each credit so one at a time. So the first credit we're going to talk about if you're paying um, under the emergency paid family and sick leave provision, there's that refundable tax credit. So let's say we have XYZ company, they have 300 employees, and they have five employees who are eligible for the paid leave. So what's the timing of their payment? What can count towards the credit? And then how do we calculate this credit? Um, so many of you have probably seen or heard about the 10 days of unpaid um, that start on the April 1st deadline if you as an employer are, are taking that method. Um, so any of that, those first 10 days that you have the unpaid leave, that time is not going to count towards your credit. And likewise, if a um, employee decides to substitute that unpaid leave with some of their vacation, uh, their sick time, that portion is not counted towards the credit. It's the actual uh, required paid leave that is paid to the employee um, that goes into calculating that credit. Um, so 100% of that is then, and along with the um, health care costs, are added together and you calculate that credit and then you're going to report that on the payroll tax return. And that, that's where you're going to show your credit. Um, and right now, you can refrain from remitting those taxes up to the portion of the calculation of the calculated credit um, because they want to keep the cash in the hands of the, of the employers. You can um, also not remit your um, employee, your employee 
Social Security portion, as well as the federal withholding. So again, that's, the, that's under the Families First Act, and that's the emergency paid family and sick leave. The other credit, the um, ERTC credit, which we've heard a lot, also a lot about, is different, and this is under the CARES Act. So this was passed under the third act. So let's say you have um, XYZ Co. again, but instead they have 95 employees. Uh, they've experienced a partial shutdown in operations due to government orders related to COVID-19. So they have 70 employees who can no longer perform their job due to the shutdown, and, and they have another 20 that are still working. So the, the timing of this, um, these payments, this is for wages starting on March 13th through the end of the year. So any um, wages, and again, health plan expenses paid during this time period. Now, again, this is for paid time. So if they have any unpaid leave or any of that, we're not counting that towards this credit. Um, but 50% up to $10,000 for each employee can be counted towards this credit. Um, then this credit calculate, so that's how you calculate the credit. And then you're going to report this again on the payroll tax return and not remit the portion of your employer social security tax. Now, if your credit is in excess, they are developing uh, methods to get the excess back to you, um, but that has not been issued yet. Um, so there's one caveat with this. Let's say you have XYZ Co instead had 150 employees. How does this change? So once you're over that 100 employee limit, then it's only the employees that you continue to pay who can no longer perform their job. Those are the wages that count towards the credit. The other, so in our example, let's just say there's still 70 employees who are no longer working. It would be their wages that are counting towards this credit, not the additional 80 who are still working. Additionally, if the employer receives a work opportunity tax credit on any of those wages, they can't double dip. So they can't take the ERTC credit on wages that they're also taking WASI on. Okay, so that's each of the credits. Now what I wanna walk through is how do these credits and deferrals interplay with the PPP loan? How are, what are some of the limitations that are created and um, how are we going to, to deal with those? So let's say we have, it's be, beginning April 1st, we have an employer with less than 500 employees who's been paying under the emergency family and sick leave um, under the, the Family First Act. So they're applying for a PP lo PPP loan under the CARES Act. They go to calculate their payroll costs and applying for that loan. Can they include the um, wages that they're paying under the family and sick leave if let's say they're using the method of the la one last year of wages? No, they cannot include those wages because they're gonna be getting a credit for those wages. Um, a pay the refundable tax credit. So they cannot include those costs in applying for the PPP loan. So then let's say they get the PPP loan. Can they pay their employees under FFCRA, which is the, the Families First Act and that emergency family and sick leave, can they pay those paid leave wages with the PPP loan money and still have it be forgiven? And the answer is no, they can't um, because they're getting, they, they still have this refundable tax credit that they're allowed under those wages. And so they can't get a forgivable loan and also get um, tax credits because it creates a double dipping and a double benefit. So you have to remember to really track these things separately. So any leave being paid out of Families First Act, um, make sure that it's not getting carried over into PPP loans. Okay, so then let's take this, let's take this one step further. Let's say they're still making payments out of the Families First um, emergency um, the family's first emergency uh, paid leave. And instead of applying for the PPP loan, they're considering the ERTC credit under the CARES Act. So now they're dealing with two refundable tax credits that both offset Social Security. So how does this work? Again, the key here is you need different buckets. Anything that you're getting a credit for the Families First Act, you can't also get a credit for those same wages under the employee tax retention credit. So make sure that everything's being tracked separately, that you're not double dipping and you're not getting a double benefit there. Okay, so now this employer is no longer, they have no eligible employees under the Families First Act. So now we're just dealing with um, different uh, elements of the CARES Act. 
So you have an employer with less than 500 employees um, who wants to claim the ERTC under the CARES Act, and they're also considering applying for a PPP loan. So can they claim the ERTC, and will the PPP loan still be eligible for forgiveness? And the answer is no. Um, and this is, there's a, a hard cliff here. So if any portion of the PPP loan is forgiven, then the employer is not eligible for the ERTC. So this is even $1. So where does this become tricky? Well, we don't know now, today, what you're going to be forgiven on for your PPP loan. But I think the assumption that everyone is making is that something will be forgiven. Um, so we have to take this with, with that mindset that something's going to be forgiven. So we aren't going to have an opportunity to take the ERTC credit. Um, we're still waiting on guidance from Treasury as to what will happen for those who took credits before they got a PPP loan um, and how that's going to interplay. Are they going to have to pay back portion of it? Will it impact their forgiveness? Um, we're really not sure. We're still waiting on guidance and, and this is unclear. So hopefully when we get some more uh, clarity, we can, we can provide that to everyone. And um, okay, so last scenario here is an employer with less than 500 employees. Uh, they want to defer their employee social security. So they're not looking at any of the credits. They just want to defer the social security tax under the CARES Act. But they have also applied for a PPP loan. So can they do both? Can they defer their payroll taxes? And can they still have their, um, still be eligible for the forgiveness um, under PPP? And again, the answer is no, you can't double dip. You can't get a double benefit. Um, and this is a lot like the ERTC credit where we're still waiting on guidance from Treasury as to how it, what's gonna happen with people who deferred payments prior to receiving that loan. Um, so stay tuned for more information um, on that. So with all the different options available, it becomes critical for employers to really map out which option or options fit their situation best. Um, but to, but in order to really do so, it's important to understand what limitations exist. So ultimately, when you're looking at any of your options, think to yourself, am I double dipping? Am I receiving twice the benefit for the same wages? And if so, then most likely it's not allowed. Uh, so I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. I'm now gonna turn it back over to Eric uh, for your final polling question. All right, thanks Robin, Nick, and Steph for some excellent presentations. Hopefully our audience today found that worthwhile and uh, appreciate you hanging here. I know we have just a couple minutes over the uh, 12 o'clock mark. Um, the last thing we wanted to do, um, and this is an optional polling question, but it is another option to, to answer. We need three polling questions through the entire session. In order to help facilitate some communication between RKL and employees and prospects on this call today, um, especially in the remote settings that we're working in, we thought it would be helpful if you just wanna take a minute and look at this. And this is simply a question around what type of communication might be helpful to have in terms of follow-up with RKL? And so maybe choice number one, are there some PPP application or loan forgiveness questions that you would like some support on and to the extent that you check off these boxes, we'll have folks from your engagement team or other folks designated who will be able to reach out to you and provide whatever consultation and support you're looking for. The second question relates to cash flow forecasting, financial modeling. Um, in this uncertain time, there's a lot of companies that are spending a lot of time managing cash flow and trying to figure out how long can we continue operations? When do we need to make some more drastic decisions? So that, that's certainly a, something that we'd be able to lend a hand with if that's of interest. The third point is cybersecurity. That's especially a hot topic as many people are working from out of the office. And you know, how, do you, how do we assess that and ensure that we don't have um, inappropriate vulnerabilities um, given that workforce setting? The fourth option, HR compliance or consulting. Just There's so many HR questions and people-related issues right now. If you'd appreciate some follow-up and support in that area, just check that box off. Um, I have other questions. That's just sort of a catch-all, that fifth box. Um, just I'd like somebody from RKL to follow up with me because we need to talk some more on this. And the last option is just, hey, I'm not looking for anyone to follow up. Um, thank you very much. Have a great day, which is totally fine. But um, this is a way for us to just ensure that we're meeting the needs that you may have and the questions that you may have at this time. 
Finally, I'll just say our Coronavirus uh, Resource Center is continuing to be available on our website, rklcpa.com. You are welcome to go over there to look at a number of resources. And our email addresses are here as well for today's presenters. So thank you again. The recording from today's session will be emailed out to anybody who registered for today's call. If, if you missed that email or can't find it, or you want to go back and listen to one of our previous webinars or look at some of our blog content, again, all of that information is on the Coronavirus Resource Center. So with that, we're going to draw it to a close here. Thanks for bearing with us and wish you a very wonderful Easter weekend. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.